coast to coast, the Dominion celebrates the long-awaited day of victory in the West. Official ceremonies in New Brunswick's capital start the ball rolling for that province's festivity. They can't find Hitler in Berlin, but in Montreal he makes a personal appearance in grease paint. Many make whoopee in scenes of wild rejoicing, but many feel the solemnity of the occasion. Notre Dame Cathedral is crowded as special services are conducted to give thanks for victory. In the nation's capital, a parade of thanksgiving is held on Parliament Hill. Veterans of two wars mingle as the acting prime minister makes an official pronouncement. In the Ontario capital, the focal point for the ceremonies is the cenotaph in front of the city hall. Transportation is at a complete standstill as the Queen City turns out to do honor to the occasion. With drinkables at a premium, one veteran of the Western Front takes no chances. With him, it's cash and carry. Out west, where men are men and flags are plentiful, an armistice is declared in the Little Red Schoolhouse. Proud of their war effort, the people of Manitoba inject that good old western spirit into their celebration. In every town in the Dominion, the strain of over five years of war is relaxed momentarily as Canucks pay tribute to their sons who have played such a vital part in winning victory in the West. <laughs> Following VE Day, all Canadian formations hold church parades to give thanks for victory. London St. Martin's of the Field is the place of worship selected for the personnel of Canadian military headquarters. large German military barracks is the scene of victory parade of the 3rd Canadian Division. An open-air service is held for the C of E men, conducted by Padre Major Fourth, with the three CIC band providing the music. Services are held for all denominations. Roman Catholic soldiers of the 3rd Div render thanks for victory at a special mass. band of the Irish Fusiliers lead the headquarters troops of the 1st Canadian Army to worship near Hengelo in Holland. Colonel Taylor of London, Ontario, principal chaplain, 1st Canadian Army, presides while General Quirar reads the lesson. Thanks are given to the almighty power for the strength which smashed Germany. In Haaren, Germany, under Canadian supervision, Polish army women run their own camp with military precision. Once a concentration camp, it becomes temporarily Polish territory as hostilities cease. Over 2,000 women warriors were fighting as a unit of the Polish army when they were captured before Warsaw was liberated by the Red Army. Treated by the Germans as prisoners of war, they kept up their army discipline through the months of trial. Now the tables are turned. German civilians are forced at the point of a gun to do the menial tasks once the chore of the Polish women. On the parade square, the Amazons are a credit to their uniform. They handle guard duty like veterans. And there's lead in them bar rifles, so you better give the password smartly. Just so you won't be under any delusion as to how they can hit the mark, the daily range practice gives you the score. To get back into tip-top shape after months of semi-starvation, daily PT follows Ravalli. Under the capable instruction of Staff Sergeant Zofia Zielinska, the girls build muscles to frighten any prowling werewolves. From the parade square, soon the women warriors will be returning to build new homes out of the ashes of heroic Poland. An old Dutch synagogue in Nykirk, Holland, was partially demolished by the Dutch SS during the years of German occupation. Now the task of cleaning up the holy place is given to imprisoned Dutch Quislings who were responsible for its destruction. 
Under the supervision of Canadian troops, loyal Holland Jews dispense ironic justice as they drive the traitors to cleaning up their temple the hard way. Back in the 17th century, the community of Nykirk first admitted people of the Jewish faith to live and practice their beliefs as they wished. Relations between Jew and Christian have been friendly since the days of the Reformation. The iron heel of Nazi Germany could not stamp out the ancient religious customs which were observed underground. Now with victory comes freedom of thought and an honored place for free practice of all religious thought. It's clean-up day for the gunners of the artillery regiments in 2nd Canadian Div. There's a touch of nostalgia in the air, for it's the final washdown before the equipment is turned back into ordnance. Nevertheless, trucks and guns must be slicked up for one last parade before going on the retired list. The guns that battered the way from the beaches of Normandy to deep into Germany pass the reviewing stand for the farewell march pass. The salute is taken by Major General A.B. Matthews, CBE, DSO, ED, GOC 2nd Div, as the firepower of a mighty force and its aerial eyes stream proudly by. A great crusade is ended. The batteries are silent after fighting with honor, according to the proud tradition of RCA, everywhere where fate and glory lead. As the day of reckoning for Nazi leaders approaches, a crushed Wehrmacht, unit by unit, hands in its arms and equipment. The eclipse of a mighty army is rapidly becoming a blackout. The tools of war which struck terror into many a hapless community are now impotent. Throughout Holland and Germany, they add to ever-growing scrap piles. Recaptured Shermans form part of the armor brought in by the surrendered army. The Jerrys themselves are detailed to do all the work of collecting and sorting out equipment in central dumps. With docility and subservience, they get on with the job. docks in Emden, a Canadian boarding party sets out on a German minesweeper for the island of Borkum. Their job is to see that surrender orders are being carried out on the island of the Frisian group. From the bridge of the minesweeper, they see a surrender German U-boat, which has just arrived after a six weeks cruise. It is inspected and formally surrendered. At Bremerhaven, the giant liner Europa is invested. Captain Scharf of her sister ship, the Bremen, was a prisoner of war in Canada for four years and was exchanged in 1944. The German propaganda front is also taken over. Mary of Arnhem, the voice of the enemy radio station opposite the Canadian lines, is now forever off the air. So is Gerda Varko, her assistant. Into the Allied net also falls one of the worst of all Nazi murderers. Seiss Inquart, former Chancellor of Austria, Deputy Governor of Poland, and then Reich Commissar to the Netherlands. Guarded by members of the 1st Canadian Army, the Holland hangman awaits the day when he, together with all arch-criminals, will receive sentence from the tribunals of an outraged world.